thanks everybody for attending on this uh, extremely frosty evening that it's become. We are really pleased to uh, to have somebody here uh, tonight who is is really a legend in the business. Somebody that, uh, although I've just personally met him uh, literally a few hours ago, we've spoken on the phone and email. I do feel like I know him because I always have all his books and and, uh, and do a lot of the work that he is uh, so good at doing. So I'm really pleased to uh, to present to you tonight from the AES, Jay. Okay, I got you here under false pretenses. We're not going to talk about magic. We're not going to talk about fantasy. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, actually a personal journey that I've taken maybe over the past seven or eight years. And I'll get into that because that's very relevant to, to the subject of this. Uh, and that is how they make movie dialogue sound so good. We'll also address movie music and some other things. Uh, I, I've been a Bostonian all my career, except for a couple of years in Ohio running a radio station. Uh, and, you know, went, went from radio production to TV sound production to Boston-based TV and film production and figured I knew what I was doing. Uh, and boy, did I learn that I was wrong. Because even after, after the first book that I wrote, I ended up writing revisions to the books. Uh, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. Before I get to that, these initials here, that's actually a part of the story. That's the Cinema Audio Society, which is a, uh, a craft guild, like the Director's Guild and the Writer's Guild. And about 10 years ago, for some reason or another, they asked me to join. Uh, and I said, okay, and I, I kept on doing my Boston-based TV stuff. Some network, plenty of network stuff comes out of Boston. But then about uh, seven years ago, I get a call from a guy in L.A. who I used to work with in Boston. I'd done music videos for him and commercials, and I continued mixing and sound designing for him after he moved out to L.A., and he said, I'm doing a movie. I'm doing a feature. We have $2 million. Would you like to do the sound? I said, yeah, piece of cake. Uh... And then I started to think, okay, uh, I got an hour and a half of finished product, not 22 minutes, because a half-hour TV show is 22 minutes of material. Uh, I might have 50 or 60 tracks going on. How do I do this? And I ended up calling all of my friends in L.A. and colleagues in the CAS. And what I discovered is that they have a different way of doing things out there. And what I learned, and what I'm gonna to try to communicate to you, is a lot of the stuff that they do in Hollywood, we can do and do a better job with it. And a lot of the stuff that I was learning in New York and Boston, they don't know about. And I was knocking their socks off. So let's, let's merge a couple of technologies. First of all, yes, the title is a misnomer. There is no magic. What there is, Ah, physics, psychoacoustic speech mechanics. How the voice actually produces the words that we hear is very critical to working on a track. We'll touch on that. Uh, I could go easily four or five days just talking about phonetics, which would bore you silly unless you're a dialogue editor. Uh, but I will give you some demonstrations of it. There's a science to what our tongue and lips and teeth are doing when we talk. And because it's a science, because all of this is a science, we're dealing with reproducible phenomena. It's not art. It's technique. And there's a reason why reproducible phenomena is important. <laughs> uh, the way they do film sound in Hollywood evolved from a studio system. And they wanted things that were reproducible and assembly line uh, because it saved money, it also simplified management. If you're kicking out 70 or 80 features a year out of one big factory, you need interchangeable parts, even though the movies are different. Somebody working on one aspect of it has to be able to work on another aspect, has to hand it off to somebody else, and so they came up with a studio system. Okay, uh, then a very strange thing started to happen. It began to happen in the 50s with, with the uh, financial collapse of the studio system when the Justice Department started breaking them up. But it really started to happen oh, about 20 years ago. Uh, film, for, for the first 
50, 60 years of making, for the first 50 years of making talking pictures, uh, film was a chemical medium, and the sound required big iron. Rooms full of interlock dubbers. Has anybody ever seen one of these things? Yeah, this is a 35 millimeter tape recorder. Uh, and each element in the soundtrack when you start out is on a totally different reel of 35 millimeter film. So you might have 15 or 20 of these 35 millimeter transports all locked together running frame by frame together. This was a large capital investment. Not to mention the fact that you also needed a console and everything else. So the uh, big studios, like our friend Leo there, uh, decided, okay, we've got to come up with a way to use this and write it off against all the productions. And so everything was built around that. Then, uh, I'm sure everybody here is, is old enough to remember about 15, 20 years ago, we had a digital revolution in audio. Okay, the studios were kind of reluctant to move to digital because they had that investment in big iron and they could still charge back to the movies. But very, very slowly, they started to use digital replacements for the 35 millimeter transports, very slowly. And then tape to replace the digital replacements, tape running on simply time code. And then, then somebody, somebody discovered Pro Tools and other workstations. And what happened, is the sound aspect of the films over the past 15 years or so started to go to a lot of freelancers in the Burbank area and contractors because there were independent films being made. And then, about 10 years ago, we get digital picture. And right now, most films are shot. While some films are still shot on film, a big percentage of them are shot on video all of them, just about every mainstream release, has been edited and finished on video. Not just the, the special effects of somebody flying or a building blowing up, but even the, the subtle color corrections. These are all done as video now because it's so much faster and more flexible. And that turned things around even further. So now you have a lot of productions like the one I was working on, uh, which ended up going out on an MGM label. Uh, Sally Field, feature film, ran in theaters. But it was put together by an independent who called his friend in Boston and said, can you do the track cheaply? And he called the guy he used to do graphics with in New Hampshire, can you do the graphics cheaply? And he shot in Nashville because it's Don Union. Uh, and so there's been a big change in how these things are being done. Okay, let's talk about what you do in the studio. TV sound <laughs> evolved from radio sound. And TV evolved as a real-time medium. It was live. Very little post-production. So basically the sound, even, even if there was post-production, the sound evolved very similar to a music studio, where in a music studio, uh, laying the tracks is, is, is often the big chore. In, in TV sound production, actually shooting it, multiple cameras, getting it right, editing the picture is the big thing. And then sound in TV production is done very, very similar to the way you do it in a, in a uh, music studio. Usually one or two people in a small room on a 24 track locked up to videotape. Uh, what you get, particularly, not, not just because you're working on tape and you're working under SMPTE. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm 10 years ago, but all this translated to digital. Uh, but because you're dealing with one person who's handling the whole sound process for a TV show on the East Coast style, uh, you can take shortcuts. This, this, this sound effect is going to need reverb. I'm going to reverb it now, print the reverb to the track. I'm done. I never have to worry about it again. This scene is noisy. Let's, let's equalize it while we're laying it up to 24 track. So we got a lot of speed and efficiency, which is very important in the TV world. What we lost, what we never had uh, for TV production, was the ability to fine tune. Meanwhile, we got the big factories on the West Coast, movie factories. And they were working on multiple projects. They had to share the labor and facilities. They had to have interchangeable parts. So they had to come up with a very fixed workflow. And they discovered a lot of ways to solve a lot of problems that way. Uh, their disadvantage was it was very much labor and facility intensive. Uh, along comes digital, both for picture and sound, and collapses these differences. And now films are being done by one or two guys on Pro Tools using Hollywood techniques and using some TV techniques. That's what I'm gonna be talking about. 
Okay. Uh, if you're going to get into film sound, as opposed to uh, how, how many people here uh, have done uh, any kind of post for TV or video? Quite a lot of us. Yeah. And that was the bulk of my career. Uh, and the terminology, what you're doing, pretty much evolved from the music studio. The equipment is the same. They speak a different language because they had to specialize so much. And they have multiple words for things that we think is one word. This is important because it shows how you break down the task. The very interesting thing is after I did this film and beat myself up for a year, we came out okay and the critics were okay with it. And the, film did fine, uh, I started adopting some of these changes in workflow, which are dictated almost by the language, uh, into my TV work, and it made my TV work better. And I'll show you some examples. Film sound vocabulary. Uh, you talk about a recording engineer. Okay, in a film production, there's somebody, the location mixer, he's called a mixer. He's basically in charge of the, lo of the recording on the location. Generally, he's not even holding the boom. He's just controlling levels, overseeing the sound. Uh, he might also have some radio mics and things like that. The ADR engineer is a totally different set of skills. ADR, automatic dialogue replacement, looping. Sending the actors to a sound studio after the shoot to replace the voices. There's very little of that done in a lot of features. Uh, Foley, uh, recording sound effects to picture. You watch a projection, you actually mimic the fight you and your partner hitting pieces of celery and slamming cabbages on the table or putting on the clothing or writing on the desk or whatever is appropriate doing the footsteps. Uh, and Foley engineering is a very different skill. And location mixers don't do that. And of course, there's also the music engineers, but let's, even, even the mixing. There are two different kinds of mixing in a film. I told you the guy the location is the location mixer. The actual mixing on that giant console you've seen in the documentaries with three guys sitting there watching a screen, that's called re-recording mixing. Those guys are called usually re-recording mixers or dubbing mixers because the original process was you had all of these banks of 35 optical, which then became 35 mag, and they'd play back as audio and re-record to another mag. So the guy who's controlling the relative levels of the voices and the music uh, and all that to what you see on the screen. He's the re-recording mixer. It actually helps to break that down uh, for a really good reason. In film production, the editor and the mixer are not the same person. A lot of times you're working on TV, the voiceover, the guy flubbed a word, you, you, you just, you know, you walk away from the 24 track, you move over to the quarter inch, you make a couple of splices, you lace it back up, you put it back on the 24 track. Of course, today you do it on a workstation. But the guy who's going to be moving the faders actually made that edit. Uh, in LA, there are separate editors for dialogue, for ADR, for Foley, for sound effects. Of course, there are music editors. They're different skills and they use different techniques. Now, I could write a couple of books about the different techniques and they're for sale at Amazon. So I'm not going to take the time to go into them here. Uh, but we will, we will demonstrate some of them. Similarly, the mixing is done in stages. Hello. There you go, thank you. The first thing they do is mix the dialogue without any sound effects, without any music. Because film is a narrative medium, generally. We're watching stories. We have to become part of the actor's world. In order for that to happen, it's not the sound effects. It's not the thrilling music. Their voices have to be natural. Uh, so you take what might be 10 or 15 tracks of dialogue, even from a single microphone, and I'll explain to you uh, in, in a couple of minutes why that is, and you mix those down to a single track of dialogue, or maybe alternating tracks for alternating scenes. It's just a mono track for dialogue. Then you take the music mix that some guy had done from 24 or 48 or 96 tracks of symphony orchestra, and you roll those in against the picture. Then you take the sound effects, and there might be many, many tracks of sound effects, individual hard effects and backgrounds mixed in stereo. Then you mix that whole mush together. And by thinking that way, you always remember to make the dialogue the most important thing. That's critical. 
uh, let's talk about just the dialogue editing. One of the things they learned in Hollywood was that you don't need to tie up the $500 an hour room with the big iron when it's time to edit the dialogue. I'll give a guy a movieola, which was a film editing machine, and then later a Steenbeck, and now you know, people edit dialogue on their kitchen table with a laptop for feature films. Put on a pair of headphones. You're not monitoring for quality. You're not making any processing decisions. You're just making cuts. Uh, not only because there is so much dialogue in a movie, but you're also splitting it out. You might take uh, a 25 second or 30 second scene and split it into four tracks. And I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, if you do make processing decisions, and that's something that, that they, they uh, started borrowing from us TV guys, if you do decide this, this track needs some equalization or noise reduction or something like that, you always keep a clean version next to it on another track. One of the advantages of working in a workstation is you've got infinite tracks. You can hide the ones you don't care about, but they're there in case when you get into the mixing stage with the big console and the big theater, you don't like the processing, you can undo it and do it again. Uh, there are standard layouts. What tracks go where? Because standardizing makes it possible for one guy to edit dialogue, another guy to edit sound effects, hand these reels or, or Pro Tools projects or uh, OMFs or however they're interchanging, uh, hand those to the guy in the re-recording mix stage, and he just rolls them in and gets to work because he knows what's there. So there are multiple skills involved in editing. There's skills of, of just the uh, editing speech, there's editing sound effects, there's editing dialogue. Uh, all these things can happen on a kitchen table except for special effects design, where of course you want monitoring and processing. Excuse me. <coughs> Should I mute the transmitter next time I do that? Okay. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> no, no, I, I, no. Besides, that would kill the directionality. <laughs> Mixing. You don't do that on a kitchen table. You mix in a theater. Something we don't do in TV, because TV grew up, somebody's going to watch it on a 23-inch set. Okay, now they might watch it on a 65-inch set, but you're still mixing in a small situation. Films are mixed in theaters. They're modified theaters, but they're definitely theaters with bigger screens than this, with that gigantic console you've seen, but the acoustics and the speakers are the speakers that will be used in a theater. One of the things that THX did for us before it became a nameplate for consumer goods is uh, standardize, when people adhere to the standards, uh, how things would sound in the theaters and on the mixing stages. This has been a battle since the earliest days of film. In fact, as an aside, the equalizer, the basic blue pull tech that we are all familiar with but now is built into a console channel, that the whole idea of equalization was first used on audio production at the very first talkies when they discovered that if they mix radio style and they put it in a big theater, it's going to be too boomy. So they started equalizing the track. Uh, you do the dialogue first. You make the dialogue sound right. This is one of these things that I've taken to all of my projects since then. It's something you can do in Pro Tools or Nuendo or Digital Performer, however you work. When it's time to mix, mute everything but the dialogue tracks. Don't process the dialogue to make it stand out against the mix. Process the dialogue so it sounds real. You can always cut holes in the other tracks. Make the dialogue right. Get all the dialogue transitions right. Capture this slice of life. I'll explain in a minute why you've got to capture it, why you can't just turn on a mic and keep it. Then build the sound effects that are part of the character's world. And make the character's world complete. Then you can add the music. And because this is so specialized, usually there's one guy uh, who will be the head of the mixing for a project. Uh, sometimes they'll even split his job. But the head mixer usually mixes the dialogue track and the overall. His assistant mixes the sound effects and rolls in the music. And you've seen the pictures of three or four guys on a gigantic console. Well, even when they're mixing in the box now, they will frequently have three or four consoles worth of controllers and run three or four different computers, one for sound effects, one for dialogue, and make it look like a big console. 
As I said, the mixers don't edit. Okay, let's go back to the topic now that I've given you this introduction uh, or the first act. Uh, magic microphones. How come with all that's going on in a scene, you don't see a mic, but you still hear them very, very clearly? I'm sure everybody here knows that that mic on that camera there, which is at a reasonable distance for shooting this scene, that mic would not pick me up very well. Room acoustic could be a horrible problem. Uh, outdoors, you'd be fighting noise. Uh, you, you obviously <laughs> have to get a mic closer than where you think it is when you look at the scene. How do you do that? Okay, well the first thing you do, the first magic, is you respect the law. This is the most important thing if you're shooting sound. If one of your gigs is actually recording sound for film or TV, you cannot have the mic too close. As a rule of thumb, any mic, boom mic, a planted mic that somebody's gonna walk past, uh, certainly a lavalier or a head mic like I'm wearing, uh, as a rule of thumb, if the actor can't reach out and touch it comfortably, it's too far away. Which means that there's a constant battle between the boom op and the camera operator. You know, how low can I go? And a lot of the mixers that I know, remember the mixer is the head of the sound crew to shoot, says that uh, if my boom op doesn't get in the frame at least once per scene, he's not doing his job. <laughs> there are tricks, by the way, for how you calibrate that and how you, you fight the DP, the director of photography, who's saying, ah, they'll fix it in post. But, so my technique, is the most important thing. Let's, let's, you know, you also have to deal with acoustic technique and the recording method, we'll get there. Let's talk about the mic technique. Hollywood is a boom town. <laughs> most films are shot with booms, not lavaliers, not radio mics, not ADR. The reason why is we're trying to capture the character's world. This gets dicey because the scene that you see on your screen is not the scene that was taking place with crew members and crafties over there, and there might be a generator over there, but we're trying to create a world that is more than just their voices. So the first choice for any pickup is going to be a boom mic. Sometimes in a fixed shot, it might be a fixed boom. If they can't boom, what do they do, a lav? No. Then the next step will be to take the kind of mic you'd use on a boom and hide it in the set and the mixer will bring it up as the actor makes the move that makes it impossible to boom. A lot of times booming is impossible because the actor is moving and the boom would cast a shadow with some light and the lighting guys don't want to change it or because he's walking through a doorway or something. So they'll put another mic and they'll, they'll just cross fade in real time while they're shooting. Uh, you don't use the lav because the lav is too tight. Remember, in a good theater, you've got very tight acoustics. The theater itself doesn't have much of an echo, so that the echo that's in the film can show through. And a close mic, a mic this close, because of inverse square, is not going to get any of the room around me. Let alone, of course, it's not going to get my footsteps. It's not going to get the demos that I play over the speakers. Uh, it's not going to get any of that. Uh, so those have to be added later. Uh, but. The only time that a lav sounds accurate, that it sounds really real, is if you're shooting outdoors in a place where there's no reverb. No tall buildings, nothing like that. Uh, background noise is a different subject entirely. But because the lav doesn't capture any of, of the, the wall reverb or the building reverb or any of that, it sounds unnatural. So they're not going to use the lav. But if they use a the lav, they're going to wire it. They're not going to go for radio because it's one more step of unreliability. And unless you want to spend three or $4,000 for a digital wireless link, it doesn't sound as good as a wire. So wired lav, then a radio. Uh, the most important thing is matching the shot. This can get dicey because a scene might have five or six different shots. You might start with a wide shot, go to a two shot, go to a close up. Uh, you want to match the shot. The, the lens is focusing our, our view, so if, if the shot is just my head, it wants to sound like it's mic here. If we start with an establishing shot and we cut in the middle, the establishing shot wants to be mic'd from a distance, maybe, you know, over here if we can sneak the mic in. 
And then it's got to get closer. How do you do that in a continuous action? Uh, but it's important, and I'll play you some examples. I've got four voice samples, same actress, uh, using, and for the first three, actually all four of these, I, I used a good professional microphone, but for the first one I was too far away. This is going to be a challenge for this room, because this room sound, looks like it's going to have some reverb. Uh, so here is what, what an actor sounds like too loose. John, I think you should know. I've been seeing another man. That didn't sound too echoey, actually, and that also sounded very loud. Uh, is volume okay for you? Okay, if you bring the mic in tighter, to a proper distance. John, I think you should know. I've been seeing another woman. How about if I do this? Uh, if the mic's too tight, whether it's a lav or whether it's even a hypercardio that's much too tight, it doesn't sound natural. Take a listen. John, I think you should know. I've been seeing double. That's fine for radio. But that doesn't sound like she's in a real space. Ah, uh, then we get a problem. Why don't you use a directional mic from a distance? Here's the problem. Here's a directional mic from a distance. Not too much of a distance, about 20 inches. John, I think you should know. I've been seeing a little me in the, in the monitor there, right, right there. You know why that sounds bad? The mic's doing its job. Unfortunately, the mic is also picking up reflections from the ceiling and walls. One of the rules when you're using a directional mic is you cannot get too close to any bouncy surface. That's the reason why uh, when, when you're shooting with a boom mic in an interior, you very rarely use a shotgun mic. Surprise. They use a hypercardioid, uh, which to look at looks like an ordinary small diaphragm condenser. And it's just slightly more directional the condenser. The reason why, and I'm, I, I, I'll go through this quickly because I'm sure you already know it, the more directional a mic gets, just as a matter of design, the more it sounds strange from the sides. Uh, omnidirectional mics sound good all the way around. Cardioids sound pretty good all the way around, but if you're behind them, it's sort of a muffled sound. Take a look at a shotgun mic. Can we see that? Yeah. Uh, the pattern is fairly equal. This is a decent shotgun, by the way. This is one that's used on a lot of films. Uh, the left half of this polar pattern is 1K and below, and it's pretty reasonably even. But, you know, 1K is the middle of the band. Half the band is above 1K in, in logarithmic terms, in terms of what we hear. Uh, and look how uneven it is at different frequencies. Each, each dotted line is a different frequency. So if you've got a wall here on the side and the actor's voice is bouncing off the wall, it's going to comb differently at different frequencies. And that's why we get this sound. John, I think you should know. I've been seeing a little me in the, in the monitor there, right, right there. So uh, take away from, from this, if nothing else, uh, if you're using a very directional mic, make sure there's nothing around it that can bounce. And if you're in a normal interior, go for a little bit less directional mic with a more even pattern. But now let's, let's, let's get back to that question I mentioned earlier. So they shoot an establishing shot of the screen and me and the desk, and I'm talking, and then we come in tight on a shot. Uh, some people don't know this. Movies are shot with one camera, generally. Special effect scenes things that are really difficult to stage, tearing down a building, they'll probably have four or five cameras going, but the, jet, the actual acted performance is almost always done with one camera. Now think about this. You got a wide shot, and you've got to pull the mic back for that, so it isn't in the shot, and so the perspective is natural. Then the guy might have a close-up, and it's going to be a totally different sound. Uh, and, you know, between take uh, of the wide shot, between the master shot and the close-up, you know, an hour might have gone by because they, they had to do the shots and then move the camera, move the lights, possibly redress the set. The actor took a break, could come back in, there might be an airplane flying overhead this time. His voice might have changed a little bit. What do you do? You don't replace it in the studio. That's not the standard practice. Let me show you a typical scene. Uh, this is from a sitcom pilot. There's a pilot, 
uh, for a sitcom, New York producer-director, shot it film style. Uh, this is an exterior scene as the editor shot, as the editor cut it. The editor is the guy who cuts the picture. I know, we, we edit also, but we're the dialogue editor or the effects editor or the music editor. This is how the editor cut it. So he's going for the best possible picture to tell the story, even though he's going from a wide shot to a close-up to a two-shot. Uh, and he also wants the best performance of each line. So he might be taking one word from one take and one word from another take an hour or two takes later. And you're going to hear the differences. Uh, this particular editor, this is the way he handed it to me. Uh, this is just one scene from a post-apocalyptic road comedy. Uh, just one scene. And he, he rolled in a little bit of temp music, music that they had no intention of licensing, but he just, the editor wanted to put a little bit of music in just to show where the dramatic music would be. Uh, and this is what I got to work with. I'm actually going to boost the volume for this because he was fairly low level. <laughs> I will. <laughs> no. You're cute. Would you ever eat somebody? No. Really? No. Seriously, come on. No way. We won't ever take the low road. You know, we'll never be cannibals. That's different. This world needs a leader. And I'm going to be that leader. That's a very different voice. What about Darren Sims? Who? You know the guy I sold that split Again, level ranch shot. to? He kept low In the middle of a word. Oh, him? Oh, I definitely eat him. I know, right? My commission sucks. I would totally eat him. But he deserves it. Totally. Oh. His stupid wife. I, I don't know. I mean, I'd eat him. Now, do you hear I the difference in volume between, I think, the wife, doing? I'd eat him? Remember, we met her at Nancy's holiday party? She was the woman in the corner with the crab dip. And Watch she had this. the eye patch and she had that terrible sinus infection. Obviously, oh, sinus oh, infection oh, came from an ad lib a lot later. Awful. I would definitely eat her. Be happy oh, to eat But her. then that's it. <laughs> You'll have to wait till the network picks it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> this was just like three months ago that I worked on this one. Uh, now, this was not done with a boom because they were outside. Uh, and there are no echoes in the middle of an open field. Uh, so they used appropriate technology rather than magic mic, and I just want to mention an appropriate microphone. You didn't see the lav that they were wearing. It is literally that big. Actually, the mic that I'm using, this is going to sound terrible on the recording, but the mic that I'm using here to feed the camera is a modified version of the same mic. The little drop of glue here at the end, that's the microphone element. It doesn't sound quite as good as my 414, but I have done voiceovers with it. You'll get to hear one. It does sound good. This is, this is a Countryman B6. They are making mics this small, which means you can put it in the guy's hair, tape it to the side of his glasses, hide it almost anywhere, and it sounds pretty darn good. If, if you're familiar with the, the Sony ECM-55, a pretty standard lav used in TV production, it's about the size of this lav, maybe a little bit bigger. The E6 sounds exactly like it. I, I can intercut them with no trouble. So that's, a, that's appropriate magic mic. But let's get back to the technologies, uh, to the techniques. We were talking about the, the inverse square law. We talked about mic technique. Uh, let's talk about the acoustic technique. You have to pay attention to the acoustics when you're shooting. You don't just point a mic. You need isolation and absorption. Inverse square helps. Inverse square gives you a lot of isolation. But there's always a battle to get rid of the generators and crew members making noise and craft service setting up over there. Uh, so if you're shooting, don't expect to be able to clean up the sound later. We're going to talk in a moment about why noise reduction doesn't work. Uh, you have to do some isolation control. And that's a battle. That's, that's one of the reasons why location mixers get paid very well, is they've learned how to do the politics. When the gaffers, when the camera crew, uh, when the crafties want to set up their stuff, somebody's got to persuade the director to tell them not to make it so close. You also need absorption. So it's very, very common to hang sound blankets. These are like mover's blankets, a little bit thicker, and they have grommets for hanging. They're like the pads that they sometimes put in elevators when movers come in, uh, but a little bit thicker. And you hang those from light stands. Another thing people do, you know, uh, uh, Owens Corning 703, the yellow fiberglass we all use for studio, for studio absorption. Uh, I know a couple of mixers who carry a bunch of panels of that around. 
and they'll just lean it on anything handy that's outside of camera range. Whatever you can do, even balloons. Uh, if you're shooting, I, 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 I learned this from a friend of mine, he was shooting in a museum with a big domed ceiling, hemispherical ceiling, and of course the characters had to be right in the middle uh, on the floor, so anything he tried to mic was being focused, and it was impossible to pick up. Uh, he sent a production assistant out for 50 helium balloons, filled the ceiling dome with balloons, and that acted as the absorber. The third thing about the technique in the field is the recording method. This is not intuitive. Even though a lot of uh, people are shooting films on video now, it's only the lower budgets where they actually try to record in the camera uh, for reasons of quality, for reasons of control. Standard is double system, which just means a separate recorder. Uh, these days, you don't need time code. What you do with double system is you can have multiple tracks. There are field recorders with eight or ten tracks that fit over your shoulder and a full mixer and preamps. And so the location mixer is mixing multiple mics, say if through the plant mics and the lav mics and the boom or maybe two booms. He's making a mono mix on the fly for the editor to deal with, but at the same time he's recording isolated tracks from each mic. In a proper workflow, and I've worked this way on a couple of projects and it's heaven, the editor editing the picture takes all of these tracks in into Final Cut or Avid, mutes the ones he doesn't care about, listens to the mono mix, but edits everything straight across, passes it to the sound guy, and because there's never been any, any re-recording, it's, it's been file transfers back and forth, uh, at, at worst case, digital transfers in real time, uh, I get pristine sound from every microphone already in sync. And believe me, that beats having to go back to the production reels and finding a take and rolling it in. Uh, so they isolate the mics. They not necessarily use time code anymore. Uh, the cameras are stable enough, the recorders are stable enough, the internal crystals will usually hold with no reference whatsoever. Uh, even between, you know, somebody came with, with a little portable digital recorder, between that and this camera, I bet you could hold for 20 minutes before you had to make any kind of an adjustment. The crystals are that good these days. So what they do, is the old-fashioned Hollywood slate. Slapping a slate is still the standard, which also means on the slate is written the scene and the take number and the sound roll number, and it also means somebody, uh, a script assistant, is reading that information, so it goes on the track. What they don't use, it's in this camera, I assume that it's turned off today, is the automatic level control. Even if you're recording into the camera, now cameras have notoriously bad signal to noise. Uh, the current generation might have 60 dB if you treat it really carefully from noise floor to absolute clip, digital clipping, full scale. And since you need some headroom, that might leave you with 45 dB of SN, which is pretty sucky. Uh, you still don't turn on the ALC, even if the actor's going to be all over the place. Take advantage of the fact that there are two tracks in the camera. If you've got one mic, split it to two tracks record one track about 12 dB hotter than the other. You just bought another 12 dB of noise floor. Actually, 3M made a... Uh, anybody remember the 3M... Uh, I forget what they called it. They had a multi-track tape recorder in the 70s that used uh, two tracks on a one-inch tape for each channel, one for low level, one for high level, and would switch by itself back and forth as an alternative to Dolby. No. Uh, the other thing you don't do when you're shooting in a field is equalize. Sometimes it might be very necessary to roll off a little bit of wind noise so it doesn't break up in your preamps. That's it. Don't do anything to the sound in the field that can't be undone very, very simply. Because you just don't have the monitoring facility in the field and you don't know what the other tracks are going to be like and the golden rule, dialogue has to sound natural. Don't try to help the dialogue along. Let the mixer do it. Question. What about cost 
compensating for proximity effect with a baseball cap. What about compensating for proximity effect in a film shoot? That's not going to be uh, significant unless you've got like a singer or a radio announcer on camera with a practical mic. In which case, I'd still say, unless, unless it's going into clipping in the preamp, maybe use the roll-off on the mic. But that's it. Save it for post. But the kind of proximity effect you're normally used to with vocalists or voiceover announcers uh, just isn't relevant to when you're shooting. Uh, do monitor. Don't ever trust that what's getting recorded is what you're feeding. I see a camera up there. I do see a headphone lead coming off of it. So I assume somebody's actually making sure that my mic is getting the yes. <laughs> uh, so let, let, let's just finish the whole idea of workflow. And I, I drew a, a very simplified chart of how Hollywood tracks work. And then we'll get into some of the technology and some of the plugins and some of the post-production stuff. This is very simplified. The blue things are picture. I don't care much about them. So I simplified it to two boxes. <laughs> uh, they shoot. The editor does his magic which might take six weeks, 10 weeks, 15 weeks, two years before the director and the editor are happy. But then they pass the pictures to the colorist who will tweak the colors. Remember, from one shot to the next, the sun might have changed. So you know, the visual guys have the same problems. They just have to deal with them differently. Uh, and any special effects that have to be done visually are generally done digitally. Uh, and meanwhile, they pass an OMF. Everybody know what an OMF is? Okay, standard interchange between video and sound in the multi-track digital world. An editor might have 99 tracks in its picture edit. Generally won't, but that's about the max. Uh, and they pass a file to you that you then load into Pro Tools or Nuendo or Digital Performer, and all those tracks show up exactly the way the editor saw them, even with the same names for each clip. So you can go back and say, hey, uh, scene 3A, A would be the master shot, B would, might be one close-up, C might be another. Take 14, do we have an alternative? And you can just read that right off your screen because of the OMF. So that goes to the dialogue editor. Uh, meanwhile, if there are sound effects being created, it go, that same OMF goes to the, the sound effects team, uh, the director and the composer or music director. Uh, will spot where the music happens at the same time, and then they'll compose. The music editor might be editing pop songs, might be editing stuff the composer does. Meanwhile, back to the dialogue, uh, that goes to the dialogue premix after it's edited, remember? Make the dialogue right. Then make the sound effects right. Then mix the dialogue and the sound effects. Build the actor's world, because that's what people pay to see. Then. Mix it, adding the music. There's another step called a print master where you're actually doing fine tweaking to encode it for the projection, uh, for Dolby if necessary, or DTS or whatever they're using. Uh, if, you, if you mixed in Pro Tools in the box, you pretty much set aside a day to kick out all the various mixes that are needed. Uh, that, that's the ideal workflow. Of course, what happens in every production, even this silly little thing that I did a few years ago, uh, is this. <laughs> Six months after I did the final mix, I get a call from the director. We have to change one of the songs. The license fell through. Can you cut this other song so that it fits the picture we've already cut? Yeah, sure, that's what I do. Uh, okay, send it, to the, send it to the dub stage where he's going to plug it into the project and remix. And we need to change this line because MGM, when they picked it up for distribution, didn't like that line. I've re-recorded Sally Field. You've got to roll her in. So this, this is the normal workflow. Fortunately, in smaller projects, that doesn't happen quite as much. Let's get the post. Uh, I mentioned noise reduction. Something that, that directors of photography and other visual people love because if there's any problem on the set, they can say, I got a guy who's got a noise reduction plug-in who can fix it. And if your guy can't do it, he's no good. Okay, noise reduction. Whoops, back one. <laughs> I maintain, even Dolby, even double-ended Dolby is using psychoacoustic tricks. There is no such thing as noise reduction unless you have an absolutely coherent and stable signal that you can notch out with an equalizer. Let's talk about the noise reduction plugins that we all have. Uh, 
Is there anybody here who believes that, that the noise reduction plugins that have a sampling button, uh, like that, uh, actually samples the audio? Is anybody who believes that's what's happening? No? Good. So I don't have to waste time on that. You all know what it's doing is taking a... What the noise reduction software actually does is profile, which is a horrible word, but that's what it's doing. Uh, are you all familiar with Audacity? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Anybody doesn't know Audacity? Free open source software, utility editor, processor, everything you need runs on Mac, Linux, or Windows. Get it from SourceForge. It's a wonderful program to have. It's not Pro Tools, it's not Peak, uh, it's not WaveLab, but boy, does it do a lot of things really simply and fast, and you can give a copy to your client. Uh, so we won't talk about that. Let's talk about what the noise reduction is actually doing, though, because that gets interesting. What the noise reduction is doing is a psychoacoustic effect. It's masking all noise reduction plugins, even the fancy wavelet editors, by and large, unless you're equalizing out a fixed sound, is masking. Uh, you're all familiar with, 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 with the idea of a noise gate in audio. Let's say I've got this picture of the doll here, and we'll, we'll say that herringbone pattern in the background is the noise. You can see how it goes over his face. We want to get rid of the noise. If I were to take a noise gate, I could set it just to trigger on the doll. Uh, and it, it looks pretty good, but if, if you pay close attention, you'll see the noise is still there for him. What the multiband expander does is breaks the noise up, breaks the band up, the same way that MP3 works, uh, into a lot of very little bands, because the ear gets distracted by loud sounds and won't hear a softer sound at the same frequency or at nearby frequencies. So the way that MP3 saves bits is if there's a loud sound, it doesn't bother with details of softer sounds at the same frequency. Obviously, you need a lot of bands. MP3 encoders and good noise reduction software sometimes have 512 bands across the 20K. Uh, it's still, however, masking. And if you look closely, can you see there's still a little bit of pattern. It's just where he's orange, the, we, we, we only kept the orange part of the pattern. We got rid of the blue and the green. Where he's blue, we only kept the blue part of the pattern. Translate the colors to frequency bands, that's exactly what your noise reduction does. So it's good, it's a good tool, but don't expect it to do miracles. I will talk a little bit about some of the miracles you can do. Uh, one miracle you can do for noise reduction, one kind of filtering that actually works, if you have a stable sound. Is there anybody here using a delay unit, either a real one, uh, or multiple tracks for noise reduction. Show you a quick trick. You know what a comb filter is. Take a signal, delay it, uh, and in this case we've got a 1K sine wave that I drew in red, and if I delay it by half a wave, when you add the two together, hey, you're in phase, you're out of phase, when you add the two together there's nothing left. Looks like a radical sign because that's that first half millisecond before I started the delayed sound. This actually works for noises. Let me play you a noisy track. This is a comb filter that I put together. On two tracks of a workstation, I had a very noisy track. You can see, this is before the guy started talking, you can see the dimmer spikes. And so what I did was take a copy of the track, slide it exactly one half cycle, <clears throat> and inverted it. And here's what it sounds like. Here's the original. Here at a large urban institution, we have a lot of patients that will see People brought me this to fix. Of time. And so cleaning a stethoscope becomes difficult going from patient to patient. You can't equalize that out. There are harmonics all over the band. You can't use noise reduction software because it's right where the voice is and you'd hear that noise breathing. But what you can do is set a comb filter either with a delay or if you have a tunable delay that's tunable enough, even Tide actually has a setting on some of their, their box delay units for use in real-time analog studios where you can set it to a 60 cycle invert. And of course now in a workstation that's very, very easy. Uh, here's what you get. Here at a large urban institution, we have a lot of patients that will see. There's a little bit of echoey now. So cleaning a stethoscope but the hum difficult. 
going from patient to patient. The hum is down by a good 30 dB from the original without any equalization. Okay, equalization is also important. You all know how to tune a parametric to get rid of a noise, don't you? It's not intuitive. You don't set it for a dip and try to find the frequency. You all know that. Set it for maximum boost and narrowest possible cue and sweep back and forth. When you hit the offending noise, it's going to jump out at you. Might even start crackling. Then you set it for a dip. Okay, enough, enough processing. This is stuff you should know for music studios anyway. We do a lot more of it in the film track, uh, only because we're trying to make these dialogue tracks sound natural. Let's talk about some of the editing where you can do some magic. This is from that film that I worked on. The scene, <coughs> excuse me, Sally Field, A-list actress, and Ben Chaplin, a British guy starting out. Uh, he's her son. She's dying of cancer. Uh, he's actually a filmmaker from California. He's moved back to the familial home in uh, North Carolina to be with her for her final couple of weeks. Hence the name of the film, Two Weeks. It is a comedy drama that never paid back its investment. I got paid. <laughs> the actors working were all working for scale plus a piece of the back half. Everybody knew that they would never get a back half, but it, it's a very good script. The film occasionally makes it to premium cable. It hasn't made it to basic cable yet, uh, or you can get it from uh, Netflix. It played in Boston for about three weeks at some of the art houses, and that's the story of that movie. But anyway, here's how I got a scene. Uh, this is Ben Chaplin. He's talking to Sally. It's cut together from different camera angles. This is how the editor gave it to me. You can see the time code up there. Take a note at about 12.55. About four seconds in, he stutters. He forgot a line. But it was, it was a good emotional performance, and so the editor, and the editor liked his look and liked Sally's look, so they kept it. And the director just said, fix it. Uh, then, keep watching, at about 12.59, he sa he's talking about uh, they're uh, going to have to get a nurse for her. But he's British. He did a very good job with the dialogue coach, but uh, in this take he called, uh, actually in every take, he said, we're going to have to get a nurse. Now, the guy's supposed to be from Southern California and grew up in North Carolina. Okay, here, so here's what the editor handed me. And I thought, maybe we'll get a hit before hospice comes. Keith. Then I got into a chat group. There's the stutter. Local hospices. So I know which nurses to look out for. And there are the nurses. Okay. Here's the stutter. Uh, actually, I went to a take where he, he remembered what the line was and just rolled it in. Piece of cake. Hospice comes. Keith. Then I got into this chat group that reviews local... And we're back in lip sync. That's easy on a workstation if you're editing phonemes. Remember I said there's speech science involved. Let's get a little bit uh, more difficult here and talk about the nurses. Every time he said nurses, he said nurses. And we didn't want to, you know, we, we had a certain number of hours by contract with each principal for ADR, but we knew we would have to do an airline version. There's a lot of cursing in this. Hey, mom's dying. There's going to be cursing. Uh, and so I, I actually found an er in another word in the same scene. Here's the result. That reviews local hospices, so I know which nurses to look out for. Then, and he's on lip. Want to see that again? That reviews local hospices, so I know which nurses to look out for. Then, that's phonetics, which I don't have time to go into. But uh, basically, all. English American speech can be broken down to 46 different sounds. Everybody makes them the same way. And there are certain rules for which sounds you can change from one person to a different person. You can even take, take a, a, a male saying a s sound and put it into a female. Uh, then there are some that are characteristic. There are some that have to come from the same voice, from the same intonation. There are some that cut in certain ways. Uh, but that's what a dialogue editor does. And that's what I did on this.